Yay, it showed. Oh. <laughs> We're now live. Oh, yes, that's live. Yay. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for arranging this webinar and, uh, and for coming. And hello to the audience out there on YouTube. Uh, my name is Anne Marie, and I am the Zero Waste Chef. And I'm going to talk about some of the st bleh, simple steps you can take to reduce the waste in your kitchen. Um, if you're like most people, a lot of your waste comes from your kitchen. Um, unless you're a huge consumer. So uh, all of these tips I'm going to discuss are on my website. It's Zero Waste Chef with zero spelt out. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, oh, but before I get started, I want to show you some broth that I started a few minutes ago, and I'll talk about this later. It's just some vegetable broth. Just to give you a, well, let's see, can I get that? So there it is. And it's just, it's just vegetable scraps. So, and I'll explain later. Um, uh, Natalie, do you want to talk a little bit about your group at USC? Yeah, so can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So we're the Food Recovery Network. So it's a national organization, but our chapter here at USC is brand new. We're turning a year old very soon. Um, and we work with uh, local restaurants and a lot of farmers markets, uh, particularly the Hollywood Farmers Market, and we help with food recoveries. So food that would otherwise be thrown away or not sold. Instead of them throwing it away, we ask them to donate it to us, and then we can go ahead and donate it to nonprofit organizations that feed the hungry. So we're really interested in reducing food waste and that kind of stuff. So we're so excited that you can teach us about it in our own homes. Well, that's great. That's 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 such such important work. And you know, like a uh, the problem is edible, which is great. Yeah, the food waste problem. So. Okay, well that's a good segue because I want to talk first about food waste. So I have a bunch of facts from the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council on food waste, and they came out with a paper maybe three or four years ago, I think that really started the whole conversation about food waste. Um, so producing food in the U.S. accounts for 10% of our energy budget, it uses 50% of our land, and it accounts for 80% of all the fresh water consumed. But we waste 40% of the food we produce. And once that food rots in the landfill, it produces methane gas, which is a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon dioxide. And all of this food waste just it squanders a lot of resources. And here in California, it has been raining, but not enough. We're still in a severe drought. So when we waste food, we waste water. And we just can't do that. We waste all the other resources, the labor that went into growing the food, the you know, the pesticides and things, which I'm not advocating. <laughs> but so and then all the oil, you know, used to harvest the food and and so anyway, it's crazy. Meanwhile, one in six Americans is food insecure. So if we could rescue fifteen percent of this wasted food, it would feed twenty five million Americans every year. But your group probably already knows all of these stats, but for the YouTube people, you may not know. So why do we waste so much food? Uh, some of it we waste just because it's ugly. So grocery stores, they want their produce all to be the same size and shape and blemish free. They Even bananas, the curve of a banana has to fall within a certain, um, you know, a, a, a certain number of degrees to the curb. So we just throw out all this food, it's crazy. Um, I shop mostly at the farmer's market, and if you shop at the farmer's market, it's all wonky fruit and vegetables. Nothing nothing grows exactly the same, and it's all delicious. So, um, and like people, you know, food just comes in all shapes and sizes. So, uh, another thing that leads to food waste is pickiness. So, my friend's son just joined the 4-H club recently, and his group went to see the sheep farmer. They raised sheep, and the farmer explained, uh, people only want to eat his lamb chops. They don't want to eat other parts of the animal. So that's just crazy, because all those resources went in, into raising the animal, and then, you know, we don't even eat the whole animal. So 
Um, and we're like that with, with the crops we grow too. Rather than letting the land tell us what to eat, we demand from the land what we want. So other factors that contribute to food waste include just buying too much food or storing it improperly. So don't store tomatoes in the refrigerator unless you like tasteless mealy tomatoes. Um, potatoes and onions should be kept separately because when they're together, they give off these gases that break each other down faster. Um, expiration dates on packaged food, those lead to a lot of confusion. So the USDA actually doesn't regulate those um, things like best buy, use buy, sell buy. Um, so people are really confused and th they throw out a lot of perfectly good food. So um, those dates are just um, guidelines that the manufacturers put on the food. Um, so if you have a tub of yogurt, say, and it's a month past its best before date and you haven't opened it, Yogurt is probably just going to be just, you know, perfectly fine. Um, you know, sniff it, use your common sense. So I get around the best buy dates by not buying processed food. So, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another reason I think we waste so much food is because we just don't know how to do stuff. We don't cook, you know, we don't grow our own food. Um, when I visited my brother this past Christmas, his roommate had a plastic package of pre-peeled hard-boiled eggs, each one in its own individual plastic wrapping. So there's a joke in there somewhere because really we can't even hard-boil an egg anymore. So um, anyway, I took a picture of it. And yeah. it <laughs> um, so we, you know, I just think we rely on corporations so much to fulfill our every need that we've forgotten these basic skills. And we were, you know, we're addicted to convenience. And I think that whole lifestyle leads to a lot of waste, food waste, packaging waste, all of it. So uh, let's see it now. I'll talk about how I shop. So cutting the waste starts with the shopping. Um, so in order to have a zero waste kitchen, you have to do a little bit of planning. Oh, no. Bit. So before I go to the farmer's market or the grocery store, um, I look at the, I have a running, a running shopping list on my phone when I run out of something, I type it in there. And then once I have my list compiled, with, and I stick to the list pretty, pretty closely, um, I'll gather my equipment, my shopping tools, and then I'll head out. So um, let's see. So I shop with glass jars. Here's some of my glass jars. I love, love, love jars. And um, so every time I post jars, I posted jars today on, on uh, Instagram, and people have lots of questions. So depending on the store, this is what you do. Take in your glass jar, you ask them to weigh it, and they'll mark the tear. So this one's 100. Um, and I fill the jar up. This is for whole wheat flour. That's the code for whole wheat flour. And then when I go to the cashier, the cashier will ring it up and deduct the weight of the jar. So I only pay for the weight of the food in the jar. This is very important when you buy tea at $39 a pound. So one time I bought a little bit of tea in a small jar and the cashier rang it up and I said, why is my tea $26? And she said, oh, you know, I forgot to, to deduct the tear. So she fixed that. I haven't run into a lot of problems. Um, there's a fantastic store near me, it's called Rainbow Grocery. It's a co-op and they set out scales all throughout the store and you can get everything in bulk there. You can get bulk coconut oil, you can get bulk olive oil in different flavors. Um, just oh, bulk commercial yeast, like dry yeast, uh, just anything. And they so they have scales all around the store and you weigh your jars yourself and then you fill them up. And then occasionally, They'll go to a store and they're just completely confused and they're not equipped for it. So when you do this, you quickly figure out which stores are good and which ones aren't. And so um, a few people today on Instagram said, um, you know, I've tried to take jars and they won't let me. So one woman said she takes bags. So that's another thing I do. I have these produce bags that I sold myself. You can buy them 
you know, I just, I love to make stuff. I've been like that since I was little. So I just sew, you know, simple bag. Here it's a rectangle and uh, I have a serger, so it does a really nice finished um, hem. So I just whip these up really quickly and use those for things like nuts and beans and rice and popcorn and sort of the bigger stuff. So here, here's another one. This is, this is filled with lentils. So, and oh, and I also freeze bread in these bags. So here's, here's a loaf of sourdough bread. You can kind of see through there. Um, and so these are good for, for freezing cookies, although we, when I do make cookies, we eat them so quickly. But they, they will keep in the freezer in these bags. Oh, and you can use these bags as a salad spinner. So my kitchen is tiny. Like, there's my, you know, ah, there's my kitchen. It's teeny tiny. If I have one of those big plastic salad spinners, that's gonna take up like 5% of the square footage in my kitchen. I just don't have room for it. So what I do is I put the greens in my bag and then I just go outside, you know, I wash them and just whip, whip them around. It works like magic. And then when you're done, just put put the bag in the refrigerator and you have, you know, you have a bag of spinach all ready to go, but none of the plastic. So, um, okay, so those are my cloth bags. Oh, and I take metal containers. So here's a, a tiffin, the top of my tiffin. There's a bottom part too. And these are great. I love these. They're stainless steel. They're not that heavy. And so I'll take that to the butcher and I'll say, you know, can you please give me such and such and put it in my tin. So the first time I tried this was uh, 2011. That's one year plastic free. And I went to Whole Foods and the butcher, he said, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I, I've got to go find the manager. And I said, oh, okay, you know, put food in my tin. I, okay, go, go, go talk to your manager. So the manager came out and he looked and he said, oh yeah, we can do that and so uh so i haven't had a problem with anyone at, well at whole foods saying no we won't do that they do get a little bit confused so at first so i would go in i would say um here's my tin please put three quarters of a pound of of chicken in it um and then i don't want any plastic in the in the tin because sometimes they would put the food in a plastic bag in the tin I think one time they, they put the tin in a plastic bag, and uh, I may have sworn. Um, my daughter may have of, of, um, <laughs> gone to a different aisle because she's embarrassed. But I, I, I don't have tantrums anymore. Um, <laughs> they don't work. But uh, so, so I find, yeah, you just explain. You say exactly what you want, uh, and then say just put the label on top because sometimes they'll put the label on a piece of plastic and hand you that and they'll say well I don't want to gunk up you know the top and so I just say put the label in there it's fine and so they do it now at Whole Foods and they actually smile now and they thank me they say oh thank you for doing this and you know at first they're like oh I don't know and then, so you know because different people have told me well you told me Natalie that they won't let you bring your own containers at the whole foods down there so I hear that from people so uh, but I think the more people who who do this the the you know sooner stores are gonna change so um, uh, oh yeah I wanted to after my produce bags so I, I just wanted to mention another little thing so knitting and sewing and just really simple things helps with this but you can also just buy the stuff made so you know, I've got my cloth produce bags. Um, these are napkins I sewed. Some of these are 10 years old. And so my serger also does this nice rolled hem. So all I did for these, this, this was extra fabric from a, a project my daughter worked on in a sewing class. So I just cut out a square and just do the rolled hem along the edge. Zip, 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 zip. That's it. And I use thin fabric so they don't take up much uh, room in the washing machine. And uh, so, you know, that helps cut down on, on, on that. And 
paper towels. I, my mom doesn't know how I live without paper towels, even though she grew up with paper without paper towels. <laughs> I just use rags, you know, old t-shirts. I have two kids, so I have enough um, old, two small cotton t-shirts to last me the rest of my life. And I just cut them into rags and, and use them. And, and it's fine. Never buy paper towels. And uh, so one time, uh, well, I don't know, a few years ago, my daughter said, we're all out of sponges. We need sponges. And I thought, well, I wonder if there's something else we can do. And so I knit these little dishcloths. And they're just a nice checkerboard pattern, which um, is super easy. If you're a, an adult learning how to knit or you're teaching a child to knit, these are perfect. And this checkerboard pattern creates some friction, friction when you're washing. So I made those. And here's another one I just did. This is just some cotton. You want to use natural fibers because you don't want plastic, little plastic fibers going down the drain. Anyway, so being kind of crafty, and those are super easy. You know, you don't have to like be a, an expert knitter or anything. But anyway, if you enjoy that type of thing, not everybody does, but um, you know. So uh, back to the shopping. So I started shopping this way in 2011 because I'd been reading a lot about the plastic gyres in the ocean and about animals, you know, ingesting the plastic and and birds feeding their young plastic and the the babies or the you know, like baby birds they feel full because their stomachs are full of plastic but they haven't eaten and they starve and they die and I just thought I don't want anything to do with that there's got to be a better way and so it was actually my younger my older daughter Mary Catherine who um, found Beth Terry's blog my plastic free life so we started doing what Beth does and um, you know just it, it took a few months to, to cut out the plastic but um, Oh, whoops. I forgot to, I took the lid off my bra. I had to put it back on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't too difficult. We live in a, you know, we're lucky we have great farmer's markets and good bulk bins here. But uh, anyway, so the, after I cut the plastic, I realized immediately, oh, I'm not eating any processed food. And uh, I hadn't intended to clean up my diet, but I did. Um, my diet's not perfect. This is my dedicated jar for chocolate in the bulk bins. But it's a smaller one, and, and I only fill it, like, I don't even fill it all the way up. Anyway, so my diet isn't perfect, but it's a lot better because I eat, you know, I eat real food. I don't eat anything processed. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, this is the healthiest I've ever been in my life. So since 2011, I've been sick once, although it was awful. This year, there's this horrible cold going around, so I did catch that. Um, I eat a lot of fermented food. I think that's sort of a natural progression when you simplify your life and your cooking. You, you just you start to ferment stuff. That's another webinar on fermentation. So, okay, so after I shop, I come home and I do some prep. And prepping helps uh, prevent food waste because some stuff just goes bad quickly if you don't deal with it. So like lettuce, lettuce and spinach, I'll wash it. And you know, spin it around in my bag like I like I showed you, and put it in the refrigerator. Strawberries, you have to you have to either eat them all or freeze them, or they'll they'll go bad. So I'll fill up my big Le Creuset uh, pot or a bowl, fill it with water, and I wash the strawberries, and I'll slice them and freeze them on a cookie sheet. And then when they have frozen, I'll transfer them to jars and put the jars in the freezer. Then in the water, I'll watch the next thing, so lettuce. And then after that, maybe carrots until I get to the dirtiest stuff, the potatoes. Um, and then I kind of have food ready during the week. I've done a little bit of prep, and it makes my week easier. And I think when you've got the food at least cleaned, um, you're more likely to, to actually cook <laughs> and not, not waste the food. And so when I'm doing that prep, um, I'll usually trim the carrots, the tops and bottoms. Um, onions and celery I'll do later but throughout the week as I'm cutting up vegetables I save all the little scraps and I put them in the freezer oh whoops wrong jar ah. and so here's a here's a jar with uh, it looks like I've got onions in it and celery and squash peels um, and then after I have a couple of jars I'll make broth. So that's what's cooking over here. And I'm just going to look at it for a second. 
Oh. I need to turn it up a bit. So, now I'll talk a bit about how I store food. I mentioned it a little bit. So after I cut those carrots, I'll put them in a glass container. Um, I like to store food in glass because I can look in my fridge and see, oh, hey, I've got this, this, and this, or, oh, there's that soup from the noodle place the, uh, the other night. I couldn't eat it all. Um, so I like to take a container with me when I go to restaurants, um, and then you can bring the leftovers in that. So if it's in glass, you're more likely to eat it. If it's in the opaque container that the restaurant gives you in the back of the fridge, you might not eat it. And then it's just going to rot and you just, you know, you've wasted the food. So, um, so I save all my jars. I love jars. Today I found a really nice jar in the recycling bin. <laughs> it's a nice short wide mouth jar. I love jars. Oh, out. It's a crazy world. So earlier this year, I wrote a blog post on freezing food, and people loved it. It's my most popular post ever. Um, and someone on Facebook, so I, every week I post pictures of, of my farmer's market haul, or almost every week, all the stuff I brought, I brought home, all my vegetables. So people often ask, how do you prep it? How do you store it? And one woman asked me about freezing, and so I started to respond. And I said to her, you know, this is actually getting pretty long. I think I'll write a blog post on it. So I wrote that. And um, so I guess a lot of people don't realize that you can freeze food in jars. They're worried that the jars are going to break. So I've only had one thing break, and that was um, sort of a, a narrow neck bottle. And so like, I left headspace, but so here's the bottle. <laughs> I guess I left the head. I, I didn't leave, leave enough because it froze down here and then, you know, then it rose up and then this part broke off. So it broke off cleanly. It was a really nice bottle though. But it's the type of thing you only do once. So I haven't had trouble with freezing food in jars. If you do that, just don't stuff your freezer full of them so that when you open the freezer, they all come flying out. If plastic bags come flying out, they're not going to break. Gonna, oh, it would hurt if it landed on your foot. So that's the... But other than that, like it's easy. Um, so I freeze the vegetable scraps I showed you. I'll freeze beans. I cook beans in my crock pot. And then if I have extra ones, I'll freeze them. Um, I freeze roasted tomatoes. At the end of the summer, I'll buy a lot of tomatoes and roast them in the oven and then put them in the freezer. And that gets me through the winter. And here's my last jar of tomatoes but they'll be in season again soon. I don't see the point of eating tomatoes unless they're in season. They're just, they have no flavor. So that's my thing about this whole lifestyle. Like, I'm not giving up anything. I eat really good food. Everything I eat is delicious. And I think that's an important thing to point out to people, that, you know, I'm not here, like, self-flagellating on my back. Um, you know, this is actually really enjoyable way to live. So even if you don't care about your how much waste you're producing, you probably like to eat good food. So, um, you know, I can I can sell it that way too. Uh, I'll also freeze the broth after I make it. Um, I'll freeze chicken bones. So we don't eat that much meat. It takes a while to amass enough bones to make chicken broth. So I'll just freeze them and then when I have enough, I'll make bone broth in my crock pot. So, I've come home, I've prepped my vegetables, so what should I cook? So I don't do a lot of meal planning. This is just how I do things, you know. Other people want, might want to do it differently. Um, when I go to the store, I'll have maybe two meals in mind. Uh, also, I like to shop more frequently and buy less food, and then I waste less, not only waste less food, but have fresher food. So. I'll plan for maybe a couple of meals, and I'll cook the first one, and then I'll, uh, you know, the next day look and see what's left, and maybe make something new out of those leftovers. Um, and then maybe the third night, you know, cook the other meal, and, and then the fourth night see what I have and make something. So I like to tell people, 
not to rely on recipes so much because if you pick a different recipe every night and you shop for all of those ingredients, first of all, you're going to have a ton of leftovers. But second of all, you're going to have all of the, these little bits and scraps of food that you bought just for that recipe and the chances of eating them all are kind of slim. And so I think that that leads to some to food waste. So by cooking this way, I get more creative and I save money and I waste less food and um, I use up everything. So I have lots of ideas for how to use up everything. So stale bread, uh, you can make French toast, you can make breadcrumbs, croutons, um, bread pudding. You can make uh, this if you want to get fancy. You and your leftover sourdough bread or rye bread. Um, you can make this drink. It's a fermented drink. It's called kvass, and uh, you soak the bread in water, and then you strain it. Uh, and this is what you're left with. And now I have to add to this some sugar, yeast, or my sourdough starter, and maybe a bit of lemon, and then bottle it, and then ferment it. It'll get all fizzy and. Um, it's, it's as popular in Russia as Coke is here. And there's actually a guy who, who has a, a kvass company in Russia called Nikola, which also means no cola. Mm -hmm. um, potato peels. So unfortunately, I, um, I always peeled tomatoes when I made uh, mashed potatoes when my kids were little. And so that's how they want them. I should have just left the peels on. But anyway, if you find yourself with potato peels, you can fry them in some olive oil, butter, and salt, and pepper, and they're delicious. Uh, my, my picky eater loves them. Citrus peels, you can eat citrus peels. Um, you can make candied, these are candied lemon peels my daughter made. They're so good. And you can just eat them, or I've used them to flavor my kombucha. So those are delicious. Um, oh, you can steep citrus peels in vinegar. And then after a couple of weeks, you strain it and you have um, a house, nice household cleaner because uh, citrus peels have this natural compound in them called D-limonene. And sometimes you'll see on commercial cleansers, now with D-limonene. But you can just make your own. Um, my butchers over at Whole Foods, they, they throw away the pork fat. and even if you don't eat meat, I, I find that kind of offensive, just throwing out whole parts of the animal. So if you're going to eat meat, eat, you know, eat everything. So they'll give me, um, oh, did somebody just, sorry, I thought I heard somebody ask a question. <laughs> it, uh, okay. <laughs> Not one of you on the message area of the, the app I'm using. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just bring bring home, I take them my container and they fill it with pork fat and I pick it up and then I just uh, render the lard and it's delicious and it's free. Uh, although it may not be free if I keep telling people this. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite things to make is scrap vinegar. So another thing, my, um, my daughter, I'm glad she likes apples, but she, she doesn't eat the cores. So I freeze them, and if we ever have apple pie, I'll, uh, I don't always freeze them. Um, if I make a pie or something, I'll have enough peels and cores to make my scrap vinegar. But when Charlotte just eats one apple at a time, I, I freeze the cores. Uh, and so then I'll make scrap vinegar out of that. Uh, so that's just fermented. Oh, sorry, just turning down my, my broth. You just ferment it, ferment, the, uh, you just, you take the peels and the cores and you put them in a jar and you add a tiny bit of sugar, like a tablespoon of sugar and water, cover it to, enough to cover the apples and you stir it every day to prevent mold from, from, from growing. Um, and then after about uh, maybe a week, it turns alcoholic and then it will turn vinegary. And then you have vinegar, you have free vinegar like made out of what people consider garbage. That doesn't sound very appetizing. If I ever sell scrap vinegar commercially, I, I will think of a better tagline. <laughs> made from garbage. So, um, 
It's super easy. It's so easy. It's free. It's not as strong as cider vinegar, but it's it's vinegar, and I've used it in cooking. I use it for cleaning. Um, I do a vinegar rinse of my hair. Uh, well, I had been washing my hair with baking soda, but it started to get kind of dry and doing a vinegar rinse. Now I'm trying the shampoo bar, and you kind of have to do a vinegar rinse with a shampoo bar because it leaves like a residue on your hair. So this stuff's great. I just I just love it. Um, I also make vinegar out of my kombucha, and this stuff is super strong. It might be as strong as cider vinegar. And all I do is let my kombucha brew until the scoby. I have to show you my scobies. <laughs> These are just some of them yeah. for kombucha. Oh, and I learned the first time I taught a kombucha class, show them the scobies after they've tasted the kombucha. I brought the scobies out first, and you know, I'm so proud. And then, and then they all looked at them and went, Ugh. And then I said, okay, now try some kombucha. And I poured them glasses, and they were all going, <laughs> So, but anyway, uh, so those are my scobies for my kombucha. So, yeah, I make vinegar. Um, uh, so that's my scrap vinegar. Uh, Okay, so that's those are some ideas for how you can use everything. Oh, and so at the end of the week, when, when you have all these little scraps and things and bits of this and that, like maybe some rice or maybe some beans, um, you know, might have a little bit of cheese and some vegetables you have to use up. Uh, I love to make soup. So soup is fantastic for using up whatever you have on hand. Other good things are frittata or quiche. Um, my daughter prefers quiche. She says frittata is just quiche without the best part, the crust. Um, pizza, that's another good one because you can put all sorts of things. But soup, I think, is the best. Um, so at the end of the week, I might have a bunch of vegetables, and I'll, I'll use them up. Or, you know, even if I don't have much, I can make soup out of basically nothing. If I have an onion, I can make soup. So a sautéing onion... Um, maybe in my homemade lard, if I have some, um, and I'm not feeding a vegetarian. Uh, you can skip that part and just cook the veg the onion along with the vegetables in the broth, but I, I think it's better if you saute it. So I'll saute an onion, and then I'll add my homemade broth, which is cooking right now, and maybe I'll throw in a bay leaf or some rosemary, and then I'll add some chunks of vegetables I have, I make ricotta cheese, and this is this whey is left over. So I'll put that in the soup to add some tang, or I'll put my scrap vinegar to add some tang. Um, if you have some fruit, like an apple, throw in half an apple. Um, just throw in whatever. If you have some wilted spinach or some kale that's you know a little bit wilted, put that in near the end because it cooks so quickly. And uh, if you have some rice, throw that in. Some beans. Um, Oh, and I like to serve it with maybe a little bit of sauerkraut and, uh, where's my sauerkraut? Oh, I have some sauerkraut fermenting right now for, um, I'm doing, if anybody out there uh, in YouTube land is uh, local, I'm doing a um, presentation in Sunnyvale, the Sunnyvale Library. I think it's April 24th. It's a Sunday. And, and one in July in Menlo Park, at the Menlo Park Library. I don't know the date of that one yet. So, yeah, the soup is yummy with some sauerkraut. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so I just want to end with uh, my number one rule. So I kind of, well, I, I mean, you're not going to be surprised when you hear my number one rule. So I did this, uh, I did a fermentation presentation at Feeding the 5,000 in Oakland. So that was a great event. Um, we fed thousands of people if you count the soup they ate and the food food that they took home with them um, it was all from food that would go to waste so we had 4,000 pounds of, um, of uh, giant sweet potatoes that no grocer would buy you know they were huge so that went into soup and I did a presentation on fermentation and after the firm after my presentation Someone tweeted me, what's your number one rule for avoiding food waste? And I thought for about three seconds, and I said, learn to cook. 
it's the best way to avoid food waste because you know what to do with what you have on hand. Um, you learn sort of the methods of cooking instead of just having to follow recipes strictly. And you'll eat tastier food, you'll eat healthier food. You won't snack so much because you'll have to make all of your snacks. Um, and uh, just use it all up. So I think that's it. I think I covered everything. Oh, books. I have to give you some book reviews, or I mean book suggestions. So I love, love, love Michael Pollan. So this is, this is cooked and he talks all about the importance of cooking. I have a signed copy. I met him last year and I rambled like a fool. <laughs> I, it was after a lecture he gave in Berkeley. So, and then this is great too, Dan Barber's book. I met him too, made a fool of myself. Um, he gave a lecture in Mountain View, where I live. So I got that sign too. Anyway, so this is great. All about the future of food and sustainability. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, I read, read one review and the reviewer said, it's Omnivore's Dilemma 2.0. So Michael Pollan wrote Omnivore's Dilemma, which is also fantastic. He wrote that in, I think, 2006, maybe, and this came out in 2014. And then, if you're interested in fermentation, I talked about it a little bit. Or if you're just, if any of you are um, biology majors or medical students, this is awesome. The Good Gut talks all about the latest research on the, on the microbiota, the the microbes or the you know our gut bacteria our gut microbes and um tells you why you should uh take care of your gut and at the heart of it is fermented food like they actually come out and say instead of taking probiotic pills we recommend you eat fermented food so this is like a prescription for eating kimchi <laughs> and it's 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 really good so those are my books i mean i have i, I could talk about books all that but those are three that I pulled out before, before we started. And, and I think that's it. So that, thank you. Well, thank you. Natalie, you said you had a bunch of questions, so yeah, well, I answered some. Do any of you have questions first? Anyone off the top of your head? Yeah, please. Um, what do you do with fruit scraps? Fruit scraps? Well, so... You can make scrap vinegar out of some of them. So you can make um, scrap vinegar out of, you know, I've, I use apple peels and cores. You can use pears, you can use pineapple. I don't tend to buy pineapple. I, I buy a lot of local, I, I try to buy all local stuff, so. But I won't give up chocolate. I'm not giving up chocolate. <laughs> not yet, I, I, it's not gonna happen. Um, so, and I've heard about people making apple jelly out of apple peels. I haven't tried that yet. I've got to do, I have a very long um, to blog list and to make list. There are a lot of things I want to make. So, but scrap vinegar is a great thing to make, to make out of fruit peels or and fruit scraps. Um, fruit's a little harder than vegetables because you don't, I mean, I don't know what fruit broth, if that's even a thing. <laughs> But that's what I would do. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I was just wondering if like, you grew anything yourself. If I grow anything myself? Yes. Well, so I have a really shady yard. And I tried to grow some things out there last year, and they didn't do so well. But I think, so the herbs did OK. So I think I can grow some herbs. Uh, right now in my yard, there's a bunch of miner's lettuce. That's just some naturally growing stuff. Um, so I we ate some of that in a salad last week. It was really good. So I'd like to plant some herbs. I think I might be able to grow lettuce and kale. So um, where I live, we live in I live in an intentional community, which I love. It's it's not it's not quite a commune. Um, I have my own apartment. And uh, we have a CSA here, so uh, we grow a bunch of stuff out, out in the garden. And 
um, the community bought a farm at Half Moon Bay a couple of years ago. So I get my, I have an egg subscription. I get a dozen eggs every week. And those, those hens are, you know, like probably, they probably get massages. I mean, those are probably the world's best treated hens. And um, my neighbor was telling me when she's at the farm, they come running up to you. They're not afraid of humans. So, um, so no, I don't grow. I have grown stuff in the past. So when I was pregnant with my daughter, um, who's now 21, I built an armoire. Um, near the end of your pregnancy, you have this nesting tendency. You want to get ready. So I built this huge armoire. It was jacky. I mean, it was like, really, it was, I don't know, seven feet tall. Um, it was really wide and had shelves. And I put fluorescent light, because I lived in Canada. I'm, I'm from Canada. And so um, I put fluorescent lights in the top. I rigged them and I had them in there. And I started plants under fluorescent lights because you can't plant there in Ontario, near Toronto. You can't plant until after the May May 24th weekend. Um, so you have to start stuff indoors. So I did that. That was fun. I made little, um, I used newspaper and I made little pots and I filled them with dirt and I planted my seeds and they grew under the lights. And then I planted them and we had uh, the plants, everything did really well. So that was fun. And then. I gardened a little bit in California. I grew some vegetables when I lived uh, in a house with a really sunny yard, but but now it's just it's so shady. So that was a really long answer for no. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> I wish I did. Well, I have another question then. Um, you're very resourceful with your food, so I was wondering if you had anything to compost at the end. Or do you use it all up? Uh, so yeah, I do have stuff I compost. Um, so I have two compost piles outside. Of it. So can't talk. We have a, a, com a compost here for the community, but um, the guy who runs it isn't listening. <laughs> He's really strict about what you can put in there. We're not allowed to put in um, like grape stems and avocado peels and pits. Uh, and different things. So I started my own rogue pile in my yard. And <laughs> all I do is uh, I just throw the stuff on the ground. I didn't build anything because I thought if I wait until I build something, I'm not going to buy something because I don't, I don't want to and I don't want a plastic bin. And so I just throw the stuff on the ground. And uh, I have two piles, one cooked and one cooking. And, and it works. Just So I put in I put in peels and pits and onion skin, um, put in orange peels. I don't always do stuff with my orange peels. Um, I put bones in there, which apparently is a big no-no, but, but they break down. And after I've made stock out of them, really, there's nothing, nothing much left to them. So I put bones in there and, uh, you know, if my daughter doesn't eat all of her dinner, sometimes I'll, I'll eat it. I, I, I might be slightly OCD. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I have stuff to compost. All right. So Erin, you how long does it take you to cook a meal? Because we're like busy college students, so I'm trying to get yeah. how feasible this is. Like, I know a lot of it seems like the fermenting you let it alone, but what about the other stuff? Uh, so yeah, I probably spend more time in the kitchen than than a lot of people. Uh, friends and family are, are always trying to get me out of the kitchen. <laughs> so now my daughter. So my daughter's your age of you, of you kids. I sound like my mom. <laughs> Now you young kids, this is what you need to do. Um, so yeah, Mary Catherine had a hard time when she went away to school. And so she would just cook big vats of stuff. She likes to cook a lot of dal and, and curries and things like that. So if you, 
if you could make a big vat of that on the weekend, um, that would help. Another thing is, I don't think, and I've been meaning to write a blog post about this, so I have, um, I have about five starters for, for the various things that I ferment. So I have my sourdough starter and my kombucha and, you know, different things. There's only so much I can do myself. So I think if, if other people had other starters, I, I could, you know, we could trade and stuff. Anyway, so what I'm getting at is if, if everybody kind of specialized in one thing, so like if one of, if, if you had a group of, of you and each weekend one of you made a giant vat of something for the whole group and then shared it. So you take turns cooking and then you can freeze some of it, you know, if you make pasta sauce or something like that, or doll, doll freezes really well. Um, I think that that's a good way to do it. So here in my community, we have a community kitchen. And so people will cook in there on different nights. You don't have to cook if you don't want to. Um, anyway, so one person will cook for 25 people. And that's a great way to do it. So, and just simple stuff. I don't cook anything fancy. Not very often. I cook pretty simple, pretty simple things. So. Do you make your own pasta or do you buy your own pasta? No, I, so I can get it in bulk up at Rainbow. We don't eat a lot of pasta. I'm trying to get Charlotte to eat less. Because <laughs> my, my younger daughter, she just, she loves pasty carbs. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but I, I have a, a pasta maker. Uh, my So, gee, Mary Catherine has made it. It's delicious. It's really good. I bet. Yeah, the stuff. What I really want to do is make sourdough pasta with my, my sourdough starter. So that's been on my to-do list, I think, since I started my blog. And I just haven't done it yet. But because I uh, most of the carbs I eat are sourdough, like uh, sourdough bread and sourdough crackers. This morning I had sourdough pancakes for breakfast. Yeah. It's just, it makes the grains more digestible and more nutritious, and um, so I'd love to make sourdough pasta. Just haven't done it yet. There's only so much time. Yeah. So, so many recipes to try. Any other questions? I have one last question, sorry. sorry. Yeah. One last question. No, no, I, I, love, I love all of this. I love doing these. I love answering questions. So are you, I'm sorry. Um, are you plastic free in all aspects of your life, or is it mostly in the kitchen, or how does that yeah. work? No, I'm plastic free all all around. Uh, it's awesome. You know, I've got to write a post about that because, yeah, a lot of people will wonder about that. The last I did an interview a couple of weeks ago, and the interviewer asked me. So I'm just I'm obsessed with food, and I'm not a big consumer, and so all of my waste was coming really from the kitchen because if you only buy food and books you don't produce a lot of waste so and that's pretty much all I bought and I like to shop at, at secondhand stores and um, so yeah so like I make my own deodorant it works like magic I've converted so many people all it is is coconut oil baking soda cornstarch and if you want some essential oil for smell for, I mean, for like a nice scent, but you don't even need that. And I like to melt the coconut oil. You don't have to do it, but it's, I find it's hard to mix everything up. So I melt the coconut oil on low heat and add the stuff and mix it up, and it makes this sort of cream. And you, you use just a tiny, like, tiny amount, and it works better than anything. So, yeah, I make, I make my own deodorant. Uh, I use homemade toothpaste. Right now I'm out, so I've been using baking soda, which I find is a little harsh. So I really have to make, make some more toothpaste. Um, my hair, that's been a problem. I was using baking soda and a vinegar rinse, but my hair started to get kind of dry. And my hairdresser was saying, your hair is really changed. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> 
I don't know why. <laughs> um, so I can buy shampoo in bulk um, up at Rainbow. And my, my daughter, so my, my younger daughter, she's really good. She doesn't complain very much about all of this, um, just a little bit. But there's no way she's using baking soda and vinegar to wash her hair. It's just not gonna happen. So I buy bulk shampoo up at Rainbow. And then bathroom tissue, I buy bathroom tissue wrapped in, in paper. Um, some people use something called the family cloth and they use cloths and they wash them. Um, we have a jar of cut up cloths in the bathroom and um, yeah, when Charlotte saw them, she said, I'm moving out. <laughs> So those, you know, that hasn't gone over and okay, this is, well, it, you can handle it. So I use a diva cup and, and cloth pads. So when the, I, I made um, receiving blankets for Charlotte when she was a baby, she's 15 now. And then several years later, I used the flannel to make pads, to make homemade cloth pads. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. And you know, that was a few years ago. I made those like, gee. 10 years ago. And even some of my progressive friends here in Northern California thought that was totally disgusting. I'm, I'm, you know, I'd ask them, what do you think women used to do? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that it saves money. It saves resources. You know, what else do I do? I don't really wear makeup. I don't, I don't dye my hair, you know, I, it's too much work. I, I recently got bangs, and, and so I've got like this shock of gray now that doesn't show up. Before I had long bangs, and they went this way, and so you didn't see all of this. But uh, I don't care. It's, it's normal to have gray hair. I'm 47, you know. Uh, what else do I do? Uh, it's mostly the kitchen. I buy detergent in bulk or I make detergent. Um, the hardest part is living with other people who aren't as into it as you are. That's, that's where the big, none of what I do is really that difficult. Um, you know, if you I just, so Google's awesome. If, if, I, if I need something or think I need something, Instead of buying it, I can just Google it. So um, my kid's dad has a cherry tree in his backyard, and the kids brought over this big, like, gigantic bowl of cherries. And Mary Catherine said, we should get a cherry pitter. And she went out, and she bought one, and she brought it back. And I said, oh, this is a piece of, you know, it's going to break. So while she was out returning it, I, I Googled cherry pitter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and find my cherry pitter. Aww. I don't think I can. Oh, here it is. So I Googled cherry pitter and I found this. You take a fork and you bend the prongs down and you curve these top ones. You just plunge it into the cherry and pull the pit out. It works like magic. So, you know, when you think you need something, you may already have it and you just don't realize. So, even though I live in the heart of Silicon, I live in Mountain View where Google is. Although they're driving up my rent <laughs> through the roof, <laughs> it's awesome, you know, for finding stuff that that you you thought you had, you know. There there are solutions. You just have to get creative, and all of this stuff is fun. It's so much fun. I don't know. I had no idea when I started it. It would be so much fun. So, but it really is. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Your enthusiasm for this is awesome and inspiring. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, I love what you're doing. That's that's just great. Recovering yeah. food and, yeah. Well, it's awesome that we'll be able to do it in our own kitchens now. And we'll, uh, your blog is definitely a resource, so thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. I really enjoyed this. So. Yeah. Well. And thank you to you people watching on watching it live. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. We hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night.